something's happened in the last few years whereby people's nostalgia has been sort of weaponized and they're sort of, there's an incredible sense of entitlement. I was reading an interview with George R. R. Martin the other day about, you know, about how people have taken possession of Game of Thrones to an extent where he, he just, he said, I don't understand how they can hate something that they used to love, you know, and that the, mm. the trajectory can turn so rapidly. But I think you have you have to remember that the bulk of people just don't think about shows or anything like that. They just don't. They just watch them and enjoy them or don't enjoy them. Um, welcome to the programme, first of all, uh, Mark. Um, Thank you. The idea of unfriending, I do wish it was prevalent in real life, but that is sort of that's sort of at the heart, isn't it, of of of, of this play? It's 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 trying to find the ability to do that in real life. Tell me a bit about the premise of the play. Well, um, we've all done this, you know, uh, swapped emails at the end of a holiday and never expecting or, or indeed being British, never imagining anyone might take you up on it. But it's actually based on a true story. Some friends of uh, Steve and his wife, Sue Virtue, who were on a cruise and they met this very vivacious American lady and swapped emails and she emailed them and, and they invited her to come to stay. And then in an idle moment, they Googled her because they didn't really know a lot about her and then discovered something about her, which was uh, alarming, <laughs> shall we say. Well, and, I think um, it was a criminal record, wasn't it? Well, yes, and uh, that's where the true story ends, and then Stephen's play basically extrapolates from that. They're, they're basically too, too British to say no, and then she turns up <laughs> on their doorstep. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're having a great time, um, and uh, it's, it's going down tremendously well. The audiences are loving it it's it's a really 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 funny show and it's it's the most wonderful thing to sit in a theater with people convulsed with laughter after the two years we've had you know it's just a delight and do you i mean this is your directorial debut but but you've had incredible success as we know in fact you've been on this program before even yes. uh, but but you had incredible success with with writing and directing what what made you feel that you know now was the time for a new challenge and what was it about this particular play i presume it was the play that, that pushed you into doing it the writing it's a, str it's a strange thing actually because what happened stephen wrote this on spec when we were doing dracula and i didn't know what he was up to it was just he was literally in the corner of castle dracula in the czech republic laughing to himself and I said what are you up to <laughs> and eventually he let me he let me know and then uh, let me read it and and I loved it I just thought it was such a funny idea and so you know he, Stephen's long wanted to write a, a play he's he really loves the theatre and he loves Neil Simon and those kind of classic um, sort of Broadway comedies so uh, I was very taken with it and he asked me if I'd sort of show it around because he didn't really know anyone in theatre and I sort of it became a bit evangelical about it. And eventually I took it to Matthew Byam Shaw, the producer who fell in love with it. And he took me out to breakfast. This is like a classic Broadway story. He took me out to breakfast and said, but you, and said, but you have to direct it. And I went, oh, okay. So that's how it happened. It wasn't, it wasn't a sort of sudden yearning to do it. It was, um, it was just a fait accompli. <laughs> That's so interesting, though, is I didn't realise it was Stephen Moffat's uh, sort of first play that he's written. And and, mm. and the idea that someone as incredibly successful as he's been in terms of screenwriting wouldn't have been lured previously back to the theatre or enticed to, to, to write a play. Uh, does that surprise you? Because, I mean, he's a name that, that, that people would actually, you, you know, you get footfall for Stephen Moffat's name, I presume. Yes, indeed. Uh, no, um, it's, it's, uh, I think he's been thinking about it for a long time, but I guess, you know, literally 10 years uh, on Doctor Who and Sherlock, that there was no room for anything else for 10 years. So it, I, know it, I know it was a big thing for him um, coming to the end of, of his time on both shows that, that he was looking forward to a kind of new challenge. And I think it was just the perfect time to, to have a go, I think. And also, you know, it, it, you can't just conjure these things out of the air. The the, um, the brilliant thing about this story is it literally fell into his lap uh, when his friends casually told him this real incident. And he's written a very, very funny thing for the programme about it, about how he, you know, they said it so casually and then he just sort of went silent and carefully whispered, have you told anyone else this idea? <laughs> Have you told any other writers about this? Um, so that's how it happened. Yeah, but it's uh, it's been a very happy experience. I've got uh, 
obviously Rhys Smith and uh, Amanda Abington, Francis Barber, a lot of people I've worked with before and, and, a lot, and some very new people who are also uh, delightful. It's been lovely. It's, it's a strange sort of thing though to, um, uh, to have to le I've left them to it now. You see, we've 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 opened and uh, yes, you have to walk away. Oh, don't you? well, I, I saw. I mean, I'm keeping an eye, and I, I will be back. I haven't told them when, but it is a weird feeling, which of course I've experienced myself a lot of a lot of times as an actor. That, that, that you suddenly get an email three weeks later saying uh, the director's been back in, and there is some notes, and you go, "Oh God, what what have we done wrong?" <laughs> so I'm I looking feel forward like you're being to being chastised. Presented. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think it's a comedy, and I, I, I believe that the, that the producers, or by prospective pr pr uh, producers, said things like, "Is it just funny?" and so on. But there is, um, in a way, a deeper theme at the heart of of the play, which is the idea of what sort of seemingly moral people will are prepared to give up in exchange for for short term gain is it is yes. it in the way that you know great pieces of writing are reflective of our times as well as being about a particular situation that is quite comedic yes i do th i think it is i mean i think there's a false distinction you know you, you can you can have it both ways it can be both extremely funny and i think quietly profound and i think it is it's as uh, elsa the character that francis plays has a sort of unexpectedly positive effect on the family by virtue of being so monstrous and it's um it's it's sort of it's it's deep down it's what the play is about but it's not it's not you know it's not wearing it uh loud and proud on its sleeve you know it's 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 fundamentally just very funny situation a very funny comedy but i think it's about something as well, and that's rather nice. It just doesn't have to be sort of trumpeted in that way. I mean, it's a strange feeling that I think the theatre particularly suffers from is that things have to be about something, and you you actually think, well, what what we actually encounter mostly in real life is 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 a little of everything, isn't it? You know, tragedies are rarely entirely tragic. Comedies are rarely entirely comic. Life is muddled. And I think we, we, we're allowed to feel all those things at the same time. Uh, we're talking about the sort of full range of people's emotions. Uh, you previously worked as a, as a writer on Doctor Who when it was rebooted in 2005. I wondered what your thoughts were on the casting of uh, Shuti Gatwa as the new Doctor and Yasmin Finney as his assistant. Uh, it, there seems to be such a, a backlash to the reimagining of, of fictional characters. Are you surprised that people feel so strongly? Well, first of all, I think it's fantastic news. I think uh, it's it's so um, from from a purely uh, professional point of view, the way that the announcement was handled was absolutely brilliant. Sort of twenty first century. You know, we used to have photo calls in TV Center, and it was done by a sort of Instagram leak, and it, and everyone was talking about it within thirty seconds, <laughs> and then. Uh, Shuti turning up at the BAFTAs with Russell as a sort of coronation. It was magnificent, I thought. Um, I think it's a very exciting choice and it's a whole new you know, direction for the show, which obviously depends upon constant regeneration. That's how it survives. So it's, it's wonderful. I'm, um, I'm not surprised that, I mean, I think that the reaction has been extremely positive, but obviously there are always people who complain, but something's happened in the last few years whereby people's nostalgia has been sort of weaponized and they're sort of, there's an incredible sense of entitlement. I was reading an interview with George R. R. Martin the other day about, you know, about how people have taken possession of Game of Thrones to an extent where he, he just, he said, I don't understand how they can hate something that they used to love, you know, and that the, the, mm -hmm. the trajectory can turn so rapidly. But I think you have, you have to remember that the bulk of people just don't think about shows or, anything like that they just don't they just watch them and enjoy them or don't enjoy them and you can you can totally you can get a totally disproportionate idea of the importance of that kind of um, voice um, if you spend too much time online or you spend too much time in that company you know it's just not like that um, a friend of mine sent me a lovely thing the other day he was someone uh, was visiting uh some from his landlord was visiting and noticed he had a TARDIS on his on his wall or something and she said as you do <laughs> it was just this little conversation it was like oh 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 I used to love that um 
didn't they have a woman once? She said, as if it was like sometime in the 60s, you know. <laughs> and then and then she said, what was the one that I watched with my dad? John, John, oh yes, I, dad loved him. And it was, it was, it was all contained in this little message. It was like the whole, the whole of the magic of the programme, but also from the point of view of someone who just watches it when it's on the telly, not someone who, who watches it obsessively, you know. Yeah, indeed. Oh, well, Mark Gatiss, thank you so much for joining me. The Unfriend is on at the Minerva Theatre from now until July and had a ringing endorsement from our listener, Hillary.